and a special segment with our spiritual advisor, Acham Brahma Bangso, okay, live from Australia on the 30th of December. All of you will again have the opportunity to contribute generously to the completion of the Buddhist Gem Fellowship third floor that will see an increase of space to cater for more Dharma classes, leadership training, counseling and retreats. This expansion will enable us to grow in, uh, in growing people through our Dharma outreach activities, as well as uh, to inspire the future into acquiring the teachings of the Buddha. Know about our latest uh, updates and activities, I will recommend that you like or follow, uh, follow us on our BGF Facebook and join our WhatsApp uh, broadcast group. As this is our first time running the retreat virtually, we would like to seek your forgiveness for any shortcoming. We will do our best to de deliver a smooth experience for everyone. Here, I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to the organizing committees, the supporters, the donors, and those who have contributed directly or indirectly in organizing this retreat. I wish all of you have a good sitting throughout this retreat. Let us fold our palms together and send our positive thoughts and aspiration by the power of all the meritorious deeds accumulated. Let it be a condition for us to return to the new normal as soon as possible for the well-being and happiness of everyone. May the Triple Gems be with you always. Uh, Sister Angie, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can you okay. hear me? Okay, I'll invite Sister Angie from Bodhiana, Singapore to say a few words. She's from, uh, she's now in Hayat, is it? Good morning from Grand Hyatt, Singapore. We have all, uh, about 30 retreaters have showed up here. So very good morning to uh, Ajahn Brahm and uh, all my friends uh, over in Malaysia, uh, in Singapore on the virtual link, and also all over the world who have signed in. Uh, this is indeed a historic occasion where three organizations have come together to host Ajahn Brahm's retreat made possible by COVID and Zoom. It wouldn't otherwise have happened. So there are many good things that have come out of this particular episode, although there are many losses that have been suffered by people. Uh, but there has been a realization of uh, how the world can still come together to work as one, and it needs to in this uh, unusual circumstances. Um, and the fact that we all can't travel have also given us um, or made us more aware of the place that we're living in and the relationships that we are building uh, otherwise may be taken for granted. So as uh, people who have known me, I'm not into pleasantries. Uh, Ajahn Brahm definitely knows that. So I'm going to say a few things which <laughs> may be a little bit more provocative. One is that the wonderful thing about uh, meditation is to have this uh, knowledge of our own mind because this mind has such amazing ability to do so much good. The same mind has the same ability to also do so much damage and destruction. Destruction, not just to earth, our planet, but also destruction to lives of people when we are being mean, when we are being unkind, or even um, causing much trauma to other people's minds. So now that I've moved into doing more work in the mental health space, I have seen the damage left in the minds of people caused by their guardians or their parents or people who have touched their lives while they were young. So the development of our mind to be kind, to be caring, to be compassionate and loving it's a responsibility we have because it affects so many people that we engage with. While many people talk about being a Buddhist, I think it's more important that we live as one and not just carry the label. 
So often we come together in the presence of Ajahn Brahm and we all look very kind and holy. <laughs> but when his presence is no longer around and it is terrifying to see how Buddhists treat other Buddhists, let alone how Buddhists treat others. And through this journey that we're going through this retreat, I hope that we have the honesty to see our own mind for what it is and to change and train this mind for what it can become that will bring great benefits into the relationships that we have with people and to the world and not live a life of pretense or with a mask while our mind internally is full of meanness. I have also said that when we practice the religion, it's not to put the mind away when we step into a holy place. That we really use our mind to question what we learn, we question what we hear, and to verify it, because religion can make us stupid. We have seen this around the world, and it's not just other religions, but it's also Buddhism. So the reason why I really like the way Ajahn Brown teaches is because he welcomes challenges, he welcomes questions, and he doesn't expect to be just followed and believed. Otherwise, we would just end up stupid because of religion <laughs> instead of being wise. So I thank Ajahn Brown for teaching us in a very different way and uh, enabling us to question and challenge and even to accept what I'm saying and um, lead us to become wiser and kinder people. So with that, I thank everyone for your kind attention and I hope this retreat will indeed transform our mind to be more compassionate, more caring people. Thank you. Hey, this is Sanji. Okay, Bapang Hong, are you there? Yes, uh, uh, just now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Brother Pang Hong. Okay, now we shall invite Brother Pang Hong, the PF's president, to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning, Ajahn Brahm, and uh, welcome from BF. Uh, by the miracle of technology, uh, you see me sitting in front of uh, the Rabba Hall in BF. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not, but uh, we are waiting for you to come back. Uh, yourself and Ajahn Brahmali, I think, uh, have been sorely missed in this uh, past year. Um, you know, for the reasons I think, as uh, both Brother Cheezing and this Angie has mentioned. Um, so, COVID hasn't been very kind to everyone. Uh, and we're really, really uh, looking forward to this year end, uh, you know, retreat with Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali to really help us to reframe our thoughts. And our minds, and also to think, I think, for the longer term, longer haul. Because I think um, even though vaccine is now there, but um, the way things are going, this could be going on for another, what, six months to a year, maybe, before we can really get a chance to see each other in person. Um, so I think in the absence of that, uh, this is the best we can do. And thank you, Arjun Brahm, for uh, agreeing for all the three organizations here to host you and you know, welcome you to share uh, and teach and guide uh, you know, everyone here online. Uh, many in, uh, in BF, in Buddhist Fellowship, have been very much looking forward to this as well. So I think um, other than that, uh, maybe just to mention that uh, since I'm standing in between all the group here, and your wisdom, I will have to get out of the way. <laughs> okay, <John Brown. laughs> so welcome again, and uh, I hope to hear from you over the next uh, week. Then, thank you, Ajahn Brown. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brother Hong. Okay, now I shall read. Ajahn Brahm's uh, short biography. His one is really, really long. So this is a shorter version. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm told me this morning he is now at 40 degrees mm. down in Perth. So we better hurry up <laughs> so he can get some cool. <laughs> okay, Ajahn Brahm Mahatera was born as Peter Bates in London, UK in August 7, 
1951. So Ajahn, maybe this year we can join you virtually during your birthday celebration. Why not? Yeah. Ajahn is a Theravada Buddhist monk who graduated from Cambridge University in theoretical physics. He ordained as a monk, Bhikkhu, under Somdet Buddha Ajahn at Wasakit in Bangkok in 1974, just three years after I was born. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm traveled to Northeast Thailand in January 1975 and became a student of meditation master Ajahn Chah at Wat Papong. In 1995, Ajahn Brahm became the abbot of Bodhiyana Monastery in Western Australia until today. He is the spiritual advisor to numerous Buddhist organizations around the world, and BGF is proudly to be one of them. Some of Ajahn's best sellers are opening the door of your heart, good, bad, who knows, happiness through a meditation and art of disappearing. So, that's all for me for now. I'll do my noble silence. I'll pass the floor to Ajahn. What do you have, Ajahn? You thank have the you. whole retreat. Yay. So thank you, everybody. And it's nice to hear the voices of a lot of my friends from overseas. We all still are happy and hopefully healthy. And even though that people keep on talking about COVID, but it's been very light here in Western Australia and very few cases and lockdown for monks is beautiful. In lockdown, it's like going on a retreat. You don't have to do anything or go anywhere. So it's a shame in a sense the lockdown has ended for many people in Western Australia, starting to get some movement now. But even so, even though we've got off quite lightly here in Western Australia, still, sometimes I think that I may have it wrong here, but I think sometimes people emphasize COVID too much. Yes, it means we are limited. We have to look after our health and well-being, but our mental health is also need to be looked after. And often I, when I was listening to the introductory talks, you start thinking and remembering that story of the two bad bricks in a wall. And when my wall was made, I think all of you know that story by now. When I first learned how to do bricklaying and I made two big mistakes and it spoiled the whole war in my view. But then after three months, somebody saw that wall and they said it was a beautiful wall because they could see the 998 other good bricks. And it's the same with COVID. Yes, and there were some very bad bricks in that wall. There's some also beautiful bricks in the wall of human beings, and governments and life and sunsets, and even just hot summer days like we have today. And if we just focus on the negative stuff in our life or in the life of the world, then of course we get negative as well. We tend to drink the negative potions of life and that infects us. It infects not our body with coronavirus, but affects our mind with you know, negativity. So we tend to see much more negative in life. But if one always remembers the good, beautiful stuff in life, the positive things which are happening, incredibly kind people and good people, then we can actually, yeah, we can still take note and take care and do the right things with coronavirus. We can always, you know, underneath our mask, we can always be smiling. Just in our hearts, we can always be, our eyes can be glistening, sparkling with the joy of meeting one another, even at a distance. And that means that we can add the happiness in life, which I am sure, I don't know how one could do the research, but I am sure that that happiness and the attitudes one has to the things which happen around us does increase our, our immune response, does increase our ability to withstand the difficulties of life. And of course, one way of developing that positive attitude in life of course, there's many ways of uh, developing that positive attitude. Some people are just born just with positivity. And I, I found out that's usually because of the, the blood type. Because if someone has the blood type of B positive, then of course, they're always going to be very positive minded. <laughs> Please excuse me, that's an old joke. But what can you expect from Ajahn Brahm? Some things change, 
but my bad sense of humor doesn't change. So anyway, anyone here who's got B positive blood type, well done. You're already ahead of the game. But, <laughs> but anyway, if one hasn't got B positive blood type, one can still have that beautiful mind, which sees the good in things. And that's something which I have uh, found over all these years of teaching meditation to take people who are very negative and sometimes and they've got good cause to be negative. Difficult things have happened to them in their life. And to take those negativity, that really quite intense suffering in life, and learn to see its meaning. And its meaning, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to young children? Why? Why, why, why? And after a while, we see that you know, these are the, the difficult tests we have in life, like going to school. I often say that I never liked the strict teachers I had in school. I was scared of them. But when I left school, I just learned from them so much. I, I grew so much from them. They pushed my boundaries, but I grew from that. And reflecting on that, I realized that some of the sufferings in life and you know, my happiness, my peace is challenged. You welcome that because you know you grow so much more. And that growing in the Dharma is what we're here for. So we come to a, a session like this for six days and we come here to grow, to learn, to exit this retreat as a better person, more wise, more experienced, more kind than where we started. So there's many things which I hope you'll be learning on this retreat. It's not just how to meditate, it's the attitudes behind meditation which make it really easy. I often say this to people because I like to confront people as well and to say things they, they don't expect to hear, just like meditation is such an easy thing to do. For me, maybe, I've been doing this such a long time, but I can't see what the difficulty is in meditation. What it is doing is learning how to relax to the max, as one of my sayings goes, to relax to the max. So you're, you know, you're in a nice room, either in a temple or in a hotel, or you know, if it's a, a monastery or wherever you are, and you learn how to make that your little sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place of freedom where you don't need to worry about anything in the whole world. And you're not saying you're a sanctuary away from the police or from government forces, or it's a sanctuary away from the past and the future a sanctuary away from people criticizing you or you criticizing yourself, a sanctuary, a place of freedom. And just trying to understand what that word freedom really means. Because freedom isn't just, you know, you can freedom to do what you want. Because why do you want to do that? Sometimes all that wanting, all that will, all that doing something, that is what controls you. It's not freedom at all. You're always told by this voice inside of you, this is what you should do, this is what you should do, don't do this, do something else, come on. And that type of inner sort of compulsion is the complete opposite of freedom. So you know what freedom is when you're sitting down, either in your hotel room or in a temple or in your own house, comfortably somewhere, and you feel so content, just happy to be here. You don't want to be anywhere else in the whole world. You don't want anything to change in the whole world. But this is good enough for you. And those moments of contentment, that is what meditation brings. It's not I want something more. What I have right now, it's not perfect, but it is good enough. Mentioned earlier, <laughs> her to, uh, the, the host, that, you know, it's a very, very hot day in Australia today, one of the hottest days of the year, 40 degrees outside, <laughs> right? And I was born in London. I like it cold, maybe about five degrees. That's about a good temperature. I like the chilly weather. About 40 degrees, whoa, that is so hot. But it's good enough. And of course, I've been telling everybody today, as I tell everybody whenever I go overseas, 
that there is such a thing called Buddhist climate control. And Buddhist climate control is very wise, very cost effective and, and very comforting. Buddhist climate control is if it's hot, you keep a cool head. In other words, you don't think so much, you're quiet. And if you're quiet, you don't think so much and complain inside of yourself, the temperature is not so hot as when you're thinking, ah, if it's too cold, that's even better as a Buddhist. If it's too cold, is even better way of regulating your inner temperature. If it's really cold where you are sitting, keep a warm heart. So when it's too cold, keep a warm heart. When it's too hot, you keep a cool head. And that way, you're not trying to change the temperature outside of yourself. You're trying to adjust your reaction to the temperature. And of course, how do you do that? Just the suggestion that it's possible is the start. And the practice of our meditation gives you the abilities to do such things, to make your mind peaceful and calm, no matter what's happening outside. And after a while, you learn how to do this, and it's not that hard. And it's also just wonderful practice for one's health and well-being. You mentioned health and well-being because, again, it's people are very concerned about COVID. And of course, there's other diseases around the world at the same time. People, unfortunately, are still getting cancers. They're still getting, uh, was it, uh, digestive problems and all sorts of other stuff going on in their body. And of course, you know, as a monk, when I see that, you think, can I do something to help just out of kindness and compassion? And it's okay just being with someone on the bedside in the hospital and just holding their hand and wishing them well, maybe happy and well, but can't we do more than that? And of course we can. And the thing which I have seen personally in my own life and in teaching others, it's just the power of this meditation to create a much better health outcomes. And it's quite obvious how it works. But when a person does really relax to the max physically, it allows you know, the channels of energy to open up in the body and to flow to the right places. In you know, Chinese uh, culture, Chinese Buddhism, we always call it like the qi going through the body. In the Indian form of that, they call it winds flowing through the body. And it doesn't matter what you call it, but this energy which flows through the body, which often, if it is uh, obstructed, just can cause problems. And that energy is usually very, very wonderful and healing. If you let it flow, it's wonderful what it can do. Uh, one of the things which happens in meditation, when I give these talks, it just as it comes, that's how it comes out. So one of the things which has happened in many meditation retreats, when a person gets very peaceful, I don't mean in jhanas, but just their body's really relaxed, they're comfortable, they're not thinking too much. Sometimes they've got what I call like hot spots in the body. And those hot spots in the body, that, that first of all, people get very confused. Why is just my neck so warm? Like there's a, a, like a fever, just, but just going on that one part of my body, my neck or my shoulders or my breast or my tummy or something. Why is that so warm when everything else is so cold? And of course, the answer is pretty obvious. There's some sickness in that part of the body. And because you relax quite deeply, you're allowing the energies to, of your body to flow where they are most needed. The body knows what to do. It just doesn't get a chance a lot of the time. Oh, there was, I love telling these stories. Please excuse me, because they inspire me, because they're wonderful stories of things actually working about this, uh, even early on in one of the retreats I gave, uh, years and years and years ago, there was one woman who complained about a hot spot in her, her shoulders and neck. She said she was meditating, very nice, very peaceful. It wasn't a painful hot spot, but it was really, really warm. And she didn't know why. She didn't expect that. But anyway, afterwards, when she came to report to me, I said, when, when did you have your car accident? When did you have your whiplash? 
because that's one of the most common injuries in uh, car accidents. And she just really just, her eyes went wide. I remember and said, Ajahn Brahm, I always knew you had psychic powers. I never told you that. I never told anything about that. How on earth did you know? And of course, I said, this is not psychic powers. This is like, all that is, is just logic and reason. It's science. You know, you had a hot spot there. And probably afterwards, your neck and back feel so much better than probably for weeks since that accident. I said, yeah, it feels so good, so relaxed in there. So this is what happens. When you get so peaceful, you don't intend this to happen. You're just allowing the body to relax so deeply. Then energies can go to those parts of the body which really need it. When you try and get involved, you sort of tend to mess it up and get make it complicated. When you just let go, relax, be peaceful, and we'll just watch these things happen with a sense of awe and wonder, not a sense of control. And you find that these hot spots happen and it's, it's healing energy. And of course, I know how that works. And I know how powerful it is. And that's one of the reasons why you teach it to so many places, especially people who have cancers, your hot spots in your breast or hot spots in your liver or whatever it is, you have those diseases or those injuries, and it works. It's wonderful to see what happens, and it's uh, usually what happens. The, the, the patient, they always keep me informed, and they say, yeah, I went to the, the doctor, and he gave me the, the, what's it, the ICU or the scan or whatever it is, and not ICU, that's intensive care unit. No, the, uh, the scan, or the, I forget what's called it, the CAT scan or whatever scan, and he said, and he told me I had to do it again, that the machine wasn't working properly. And any of you, if you go to a doctor, you've got some sort of disease and they scan that particular part of your body with high tech. And they ask you, I think we need you to do it again, straight away because the machine is not working. Please smile. Because usually nearly all the times they come back afterwards and say, well, the machine's working, it's perfect. What have you been doing? Because the disease has gone or the tumor has disappeared or the whatever it is has vanished. Why? And of course it is because that your meditation has really taken off and has done what it's meant to do, giving a huge boost of energy to one part of your body. And that heals it. <laughs> it even with viruses. I may be going a bit too far over here, but even Ajahn Shah, he told me that he had malaria fever for years and years and years and years. And, you know, if that was what forest monks had in those days of living in Thailand, you couldn't really avoid it. There's so many mosquitoes around. And he said it was very debilitating, but one day he was in the middle of a fever, of, uh, of malaria fever, and he decided he's not going to move, he's not going to do anything, he's just going to sit there and meditate. And he described it as being in the center of like this huge fire, like the whole, like sitting in a forest, like the whole forest was ablaze and it was really hot. But in the center, you know, he couldn't feel the heat so much. He could still know that the heat was really increasing and increasing, increasing. And that was how he envisaged his body, just enduring a very massive uh, malaria fever. But then he wouldn't move at all. He just kept so peaceful inside. And then the, the, the heat got so big, so intense, it exploded. That's how he experienced it. And afterwards, he was very, very peaceful and still. And that was the last time he had malaria fever. I don't know how you explain that, but nevertheless, his mind was so peaceful and strong. The meditation overcame it. So there's great things happen through meditation. But of course, it's not just with your body, it's just with your mind, understanding great parts of, of uh, psychology and psychiatry as well. And as you all know, I was a scientist. I never sort of studied psychology or psychiatry. But nevertheless, many people just ask me questions and some of the answers work. And all of that you learn from your own meditation. And you know, many times that people ask me about, say, marriage, relationships. 
But I think you all know, I've never been married, so I don't know why you ask me. But nevertheless, you understand just how one person relates to another person. And all those insights, all those understandings come from meditation. And even on a deep level, what really inspired me years ago was discovering that one of the colleagues, he was more senior to me at Cambridge University. And uh, Josephson, he was the only Welsh man who's uh, received the Nobel Prize in physics. And he got that great insight uh, into quantum tunneling at close to zero degrees Kelvin, absolute zero. And he got that great insight after he emerged from the meditation. And so that was gave him the innovation to actually get a Nobel Prize in physics. So that's a really immense power of the mind which we can we can give to ourselves no matter what area you are dealing with in this world. Um, dealing with stress, of course, knowing how to meditate, you can do so much work with more productivity and more peace. It's, it just works. There's so many times you see its benefits. So how we actually do this, simple thing, it's nice to close your eyes when you're meditating. The reason why we close our eyes when we're meditating is that it cuts off one sense. The, one of the strongest senses we have is sight. And we're always concerned with you know, people in the room coming and going. Before you close your eyes though, whatever room you're sitting in right now, with your eyes open, just have a look. What do you see in the room or the hall or wherever it is you are sitting down right now? Too often people see the things in the room, the chairs, the people, the floor, the ceiling, what's on the walls, the doors, the windows, because we have trained ourselves to see things. But instead of seeing stuff, material stuff, see if you can see the space between things in the room. The great emptiness in what, first of all, you think is a very, very congested room. Because the space in rooms is always greater than the things in the room. And that space, that emptiness, is all it needs is someone to ask you to look at it, and it's there. The same when we go out, to, to see and rather hear the silence between all the noise. The silence is there, but very often we haven't trained ourselves to actually to hear the silence. And then we can actually hear the quietness between our thoughts. Often people, they have the opinion, they're always thinking. Now all the time, 24 seven, even when they're asleep, they're just thinking about something, dreaming or whatever because they haven't learned how to notice the space between the thoughts, like the space in the room we're in now. So a lot of the meditation is learning how to change our perception of things and look at the space between your thoughts. Look at the peace between the noise. Look at the joy and the happiness you know, between the moments of suffering we have and looking for the, the minutes of health we have in our sicknesses. Things like that allow the mind to see the positive, the good bricks in the wall, which means we don't get so negative, which means we can live with uh, the things we have to deal with in life. And we don't always need to cure, get rid of the things which we are, in, are annoying us, get rid of the people which are annoying us, get rid of the past, you know, which was very painful for us. We have these wonderful ways of dealing with almost everything. And if it's a very nasty thing we have to endure right now, we can just be with it. You know, this is, we're learning, we're growing, we're making peace with things. And after a while, we learn in meditation, we can be at peace with almost anything. And that's literally with almost anything. So I don't know how we do this. 
please, when you start meditating, you close your eyes. And learning how to relax the body is not such a hard thing to do. And you know, you learn how to be aware of the parts of the body. One of the nice things about the body awareness part of meditation is, you know, the mind is something a little bit more distant to many people, and they can argue and philosophize what the mind actually is. But the body, you know, you know that much better than your mind. And you know how it feels. You've had injuries and you had diseases and have bruises and all sorts of stuff on your body. So you've got to know the body over your lifetime so far with much greater clarity. And so you use that experience to know your body, parts of it. So we do that by starting the meditation, by scanning the body. That's what it's usually called, scanning the body. And of course, the usual scanning of the body, people start from their head and they scan down to their feet. And being a rebellious, person ever since I was young and I make use of that rebelliousness to do something different if it works if it's better not always doing the same trying things out I always found that if you're going to scan the body starting from your toes is much more effective the bottom of your body the reason is that nothing much is going on there so you can just experiment just trying to feel your toes even right now whatever you're doing wherever you are can you feel your toes now? Don't look at them. Don't touch them. Just ask your, get your mind to ask your toes, how are you down there? And I do that and I can feel my toes now. If you find it difficult being sensitive to your toes, just wiggle them. Once you start to wiggle them, you can feel them. And start wiggling them, but carry on feeling them. Because once you can feel and know the sensations in something like your toes, you have this wonderful sense of power and control. You can relax them. You can tense them up if you like. I'm going to go on a side issue here, but there was one of the monks in my monastery some actually quite a few years ago now. And the poor young monk had a very, very bad back. Every time he meditated, it was always a sore back. Tried sitting in special chairs, cushions, and nothing worked. So he went off to see his GP here, and the GP just uh, arranged to go and scan of his back. And when the, uh, the uh, scan came back, they told him he had some uh, genetic deformity in his spine. And he said that he's always going to suffer when he sits without moving. And they said the best thing to do is don't meditate. But imagine saying that to a monk. As a monk, you know, you can't meditate. It's like saying to a cook, you can't eat. It's like saying to a footballer, you can't kick a ball. I mean, this is his life. This is his love to meditate. So he wasn't all that happy with the doctor's recommendations, but he didn't know what to do. But he managed to get this wonderful piece of advice that in the back of your spine, sorry, in the spine, in your back, on either side of the spine is muscles which are there, but which most of us can't feel. We don't feel them because we don't have to. Our brain is very efficient and only is sensitive to things it has to be sensitive to. And if it's something which is just you know, not necessary, then you don't make that neural connection in your brain, so you can't be aware of them. So you had to learn how to bring awareness to those muscles which most of us have, but we don't really feel. So the exercise was by using his fingers to rub both sides of the back where those muscles were every morning for about 15 minutes, an exercise. And after about three months of doing that, you know, he could actually feel those muscles without needing to touch them. In the same way that I can feel my, my hands, I can feel my feet. But he learned how to be sensitive to those muscles on either side of his spine. He was mindful of them. And the next thing he did was to exercise them. And how do you exercise them? How do you expand them, contract them, and you know, move them? Just like a child learns, trial and error. You know, try this, try that, and eventually they moved. So he actually learned from the feedback which mindfulness gives you on how to 
exercise those two muscles on either side of the spine. It took him another three months or so. And then after that, uh, six months, he could exercise those muscles and he exercised them every day until they became so strong, much stronger than the same muscles which I have and probably you have, until they became so strong that they totally compensated for the weakness, genetic weakness in his spine. And you can sit meditation without any problem anymore. And it was just one example of using that ability to be aware of your body and to be able to relax it, tighten it up if you need to, to exercise it, stretch it until such a time your body becomes excess, well, not excessively, but extraordinarily strong in that area. And you can use that to help your health and well being. So I prefer going down to my feet, first of all, feeding those feet, really getting to know them at the beginning of meditation and basically just checking, are you okay down there? And as you know, you see me meditating in Singapore or in uh, Malaysia or wherever else you are in the world. I always prefer meditating cross-legged on the floor. So that's what I got used to over the, all these years. And my knees are still really, really good for a 69 year old. Actually, for, even for a young person, and these are pretty good. But, you know, when I teach a meditation retreat on Zoom, or uh, I've done some ones on Skype as well, that you have to sit in a chair. And I don't like sitting in chairs, but you have to, so I learned how to meditate on a chair. And it's so important for me to actually to check my legs when I'm sitting on a chair. I'm not used to sitting on chairs to make sure that the feet aren't too far forward, aren't too far back, aren't too far apart. They feel good. And that's what I do to be aware of that part of the body called feet and legs. And if they need any adjustment, any adjustment at all, I adjust straight away. Move the feet, move the knees, move the legs. And I do this with my eyes closed so that I'm much more sensitive until my legs, my knees, my feet, and my toes are just the best possible position. It's not an indulgence. It's a very wise thing to do because not only am I developing those two qualities called mindfulness and kindness. First time I've introduced this word kindness. I'm kind to my body. I've got to live with my body for many, many more years. So because I have to live with my body, I've got to be kind to it, make sure it's okay. So I'm making sure my legs are in the best possible position. And if you have some uh, trouble anywhere in your body, like you know, sore knees or, or an injury, a bruise in your thigh or something, I don't know. But if you have any injury somewhere, you focus on it really focus on it with full awareness as much as you possibly can and see what makes that ache that pain less painful and it's always a kindness it's the most important part present moment awareness so you're not worried about where this is going to lead to oh i got an ache in my knee oh my knee's going to have to be replaced oh i won't be able to do this i'll shut up all that negative proliferation in the future. It's right here right now. Be kind to it. Just with your mind, you're wishing it all the very, very best. And whenever I see any of you, which especially people I've known such a long time, it always gives me so much happiness. And I try and give that happiness back to you. A nice smile. A nice, just beautiful sort of thing. And I see you again. How are you? When you do that to me, it makes me feel relaxed. When I do that to you, I hope it makes you very relaxed. When you do that to yourself, say to your knee, it makes your knee relaxed. The power of kindness that is focused in this moment is very intense. The peaceful, healing type of intensity. When I do that to any knee, I might have a little ache, I may have hit it somewhere today, I don't know. I, Give that kindness in this moment to my knee and the whole knee just relaxes and feels at ease. This beautiful feeling of ease is what we're generating. 
And as we bring up that sense of ease, ease is always delightful, it's pleasurable. You know what it's like having aches and pains in the body, you can't find the comfortable position and it's just so irritating. But when you have the ability to relax your body, even just my feet become just delightful. And my legs, delightful. It's just so relaxed, it's like you've had a massage. Well, like I say, but I've never done it for, uh, like being in a, I haven't done it ever, going in a jacuzzi. And I know when I say I haven't been in a jacuzzi ever, please, next time I come to Singapore, okay, I'll don't arrange one for me, okay? <laughs> I don't need a jacuzzi, but people go to those things in order to, again, relax. Yeah, I can do that just sitting on a chair. Or if you want to do an experiment to see who gets more relaxed, Ajahn Brahm just sitting cross-legged on the floor or someone in a jacuzzi, I'm pretty sure that I'd probably beat them. However you can man it, man it, uh, measure relaxation. But anyway, relax your legs and relax my butt, relax my... Now we get to the interesting point, the back and then the front of the back, the torso. There's so many organs in there. And that's your like, your, your uh, control, not control center. That's the workers, you know, your, your guts, your tummy, your digestive tract, you know, your liver, your kidneys, your, I don't know, your heart, stomach, lungs, whatever. That's really important organs in there, which keep you going. And what I do, I always just scan through them. If I feel something which is not quite right, I pause. I don't try and locate, what is this? Is this my liver or my kidney? I don't really care exactly what organ it is. I just feel it. Feel there is an ache there or there's an imbalance or there's even pain there. And I go right into it, center as, into it as, possible, as much as I possibly can. And I allow the mindfulness to zoom in there, to feel it fully and don't be afraid. And then when you go into it fully, you do it with this wonderful sense of kindness. There's a poor part of my body, like sometimes you might find an abandoned kitten somewhere, hasn't been fed and so afraid. And you just give it all this love and kindness and until eventually you can ask that little kitten to come into your arms. And cuddle it, warm it, feed it, protect it, give it the feeling of safety. And that's what I do to, if it's my liver or my kidney or anything else in there, which is not quite right, you invite it in, come in, don't be afraid. And as it comes in, closer and closer in, you give it this wonderful sense of kindness and it relaxes and heals. And this is what you do to your own body. It's important for you, so you can remain healthy and free from all these diseases. COVID again reminds us that diseases are there. So... How can we be proactive before they actually hit us? How can we strengthen our, our ability to heal ourselves? It's one of the things. It's beautiful mindfulness and kindness. Be able to practice on your own body. And it really, 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 really works. Okay, more examples. Oh, <laughs> oh the time. Oh, this was many, many years ago now when I was in First time I went to Canberra, the capital of Australia, which is also the coldest city of Australia. <laughs> and I never thought at that time, I didn't do research, that any part of Australia could be that freezing. And so I went there and didn't have any sort of warm weather, sorry, cold weather clothing, no beanie or anything to wear on my bald head. And oh, the people were so kind, they were overly kind to me. So they took me out everywhere, showed me all over Canberra the whole day. And I was exhausted. And because I you know, didn't have much rest at all, I didn't have any rest that day. And I started getting a cold. Now the real you know, nasty type of colds with all the fluid coming out of your nose and your eyes and coughing all the time. And oh, I felt really terrible. Which you know, normally most people go and take a rest. And go to bed early or something, take a cup of Panadol or whatever and just uh, rest. But I didn't have that freedom. I was going to give a talk that night and so many people had come. 
I was at this temple, I couldn't let the monks down at this temple. So I started giving this talk. Not like the talk I'm giving now, because every <laughs> wiping all this snot from my nose is very disgusting. And you can't give a talk like that. I was trying my best. But after half an hour, you could see that people were looking at the floor, they're turning around. They weren't paying any attention at all. And quite understandably, it was one of the worst talks I'd ever given. He couldn't because he had this blooming cold. So I asked people, I said, oh, we were going to do a meditation. Let's do a meditation for half an hour. And so they thought, yeah, good idea. So we did a meditation. Not a guided one, just quiet. In that sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, I could meditate well enough. I know how to do this. Really focus inside. Focus so much. And be kind to relax all the stuff which was creating this reaction. And then after half an hour, I gave an hour's talk. No sneezing, no coughing. No water running from my eyes. You know, these days it's such a long time ago. I wish that was uh, had been videoed because it would have been quite impressive. The a very big cold and half an hour meditation was gone. Ooh, that's really, really wonderful to see that happening inside yourself. You're not making it up. It works. No medications. Just not even a cup of tea. They didn't have tea. It was in a Vietnamese temple. They didn't have English tea. They had some. I think green tea, but that didn't, no, no, it doesn't even have that. But anyway, didn't need it. So this is actually how the meditation can really work. So, so far I've given some instructions, but mostly right now it has been like a marketing 45 minutes, trying to sell the amazing uh, results when you learn how to meditate. It doesn't take that much. And just how you can get really peaceful, very healthy and have a wonderful life. So according to the program, it is supposed to be a little guided meditation. So if it's okay with everybody, I'll do a guided meditation for 15 minutes. Is that okay? I can't hear you, so I assume it's okay. <laughs> so before we do that, if you want to just get up and stretch, whatever you need to do. Sergeant Brown, could we have a toilet break, please? Okay, yeah, a letting go break. I thought you actually yes, got please. what I was talking. Oh, you're very respectful. Very Thank good. Thank you. Okay, five minute toilet break, break, and off you go. On your marks, get set, go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't need a toilet break today because it's so hot here. I'm just sweating. Does I need more water? Need to add to my my uh, hydration, not take it away. Oh, good old. Yeah. For those around here, can you explain where you are? What room yeah. you are in? Ah, yeah. This and is... the, the, the certificate behind you and the map. Oh. oh, yeah, okay, very good. So you see right behind me is the door, that's to my toilet. I remember doing, <laughs> doing a, a re video retreat on Zoom and I left that door open and people said, Ajahn Brahm, please, when you're on Zoom, please close your toilet door. <laughs> That's a toilet door. The map, which you see, uh, when you see on the screen, it's to my left or on the right of the screen. That is the little map of uh, Bodhinyana Monastery. I don't know if you can see, but I, I can't really point to it. But just, no, where's it gone? No, no my hand doesn't work on this. On the bottom, uh, the bottom left of the screen, the corner of the screen, that is uh, Bunyana Monastery, and opposite is Jana Grove, and some more land, which is above that. That's you know, where we live. That's the property of Bunyana Monastery and Jana Grove. So that, you know, when we're doing any building work or moving monks around different huts. That's actually what we look at. And there's a little certificate on the other side. That is a certificate for the World Buddhist Summit, a Japanese group who tried to uh, join all the Buddhist groups together 
the person who uh, asked me to join that group was none other than the Chief Reverend, Dr. Casey Damananda. And he asked me to join it, he said, because, you know, I was at the time reasonably young, fit, innovative. And he said, we wanted to do something to help Buddhism in the world. And not just to have a place where senior monks can again be senior again and just uh, not be challenged, not use their positions to move things forward in the Buddhist world. So he said, you know, you are one, I want to join this Buddhist summit. And just as the chief reverend was always very innovative and do things differently. Now it's still keeping within our tradition, but moving it forward. I always respected him for that. So that's the, this is the little room. I call it my office next to my cave. And in the cave, you know, it's where I live sleep and meditate that's all i do there sleep and meditate i refuse to do anything on a computer in my cave that's work free zone in the sense of you know computers or writing out um, uh, any reports or whatever because i always keep a place which is just for my meditation and nothing else meditation and rest sleeping as well it's nice and quiet in there but that's my little holy corner my cave. So this is next door. So this has electricity, but doesn't have aircon. So that's why it's sometimes a bit hot. It's only heat. Keep a cool head. <laughs> I was just going to wait for another minute or two before people come back. That's my little room. Very small room, but it's enough. Uh, to do all the business you need to do. For your info, Ajahn, there's almost 600 participants registered. Excellent, great. Yeah. And I must admit, if I did see the names, there'll be some which we call in this monastery the usual <laughs> suspects. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter what retreat I'm doing, what group, where in the whole world, there's still, you always find them online. <laughs> I don't mind. Serial stalkers. <laughs> well, of course, you're all really, really most welcome. <laughs> you're old friends. Talk about old friends, just, uh, just with my monks yesterday, a day or two ago, I was telling the monks in my monastery, the Sangha here, said, oh, yeah, I'm getting old now. You know, your monks can be so nice and so kind. They said, Ajahn Brahm, you're not getting old. And I said, oh, thank you. You're so kind. And they said, you're not getting old. You're already old. <laughs> I said, ah, that's not what I thought you meant. <laughs> you don't mind being old. <laughs> How's the toilet break, Angie? Uh, it's uh, almost finishing. <laughs> OK, I, I just I think a few. But the good thing is into. there are quite a there are two sets of toilets so so it is faster than the norm. Yay, well done. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, no Thank trouble you. at all. I just wait for another minute or so. But <laughs> so I think there will be no travel for you either next year from the looks of things. No, there is. I'm going overseas on the second of January. Where are you going? To Tasmania? <laughs> Close, Melbourne. <laughs> That's not what, from Perth to Melbourne, you have to go over the Australian Bight. That's over land. No, oh, it's over the Bight. The Bight is the ocean. The fastest way, a little curve, and it goes uh, over the sea, just past Norseman, and then comes back again around Adelaide, back to land. That's a bit stretching it. <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> we're supposed to do stretching. That's part of the retreat. We have a stretching time. So I can't do too much physical stretching. So sometimes I just stretch the speech. But that is not lying. It's still over C. Okay. Okay. Have you put on weight or have you lost some weight? Um, I have grained gravitas the older <laughs> I get. It's over Zoom, we can't tell. Exactly. Yes, that's why I like retreats in Zoom. <laughs> We miss feeding you, Ajahn. Miss <laughs> feeding. I don't think my tummy 
does. Otherwise, I get fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. No, I'm That's just, one of our joys. Well, yes, well, you know, so I've got to be kind and just accepting and let things be and don't measure things like weight. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people I just, I just do watch my weight. I watch it. I don't do anything about it, but I do watch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You... Let's get out of trouble and start meditating before someone asks me some even more challenging questions. We'll start, we can start again now over here. Thank you. Eileen, on your side is okay? Oh, she's dropped out. Eileen. Um, uh, okay, no response. So we'll go, we go ahead. <laughs> oh, already meditated. We're probably already in jhanas. Okay, it's only going to be a 15 minute one, a very short one. Because I have to go down. <laughs> they reminded me to get fed feeding time in half an hour. So close your eyes. With your eyes closed. What well, actually what I will do is I will lead it and then I'll let you know when I'm disappearing, when I'm just going out. But is it okay if I just let one of you just close off? Do you want to close off at 10.30 or when do you want to close off? Or just carry on. I'll leave it up to you anyway. So close your eyes. And remember, this is meditation time. Not to do anything else in the whole world. It's a time you set aside. It's not a time to figure out all the problems you have in life. Or to figure out how you can get back at that terrible person who hurt you. It's so the time just to be in the present moment, just now. The past is all the work that you prepared to get here. And the future is being made right now, making peace right now. It's the best thing you can do for your future and for the future of your family and the world. We bring all the attention to the present moment and with your body. How's your body right now? How is it sitting? What's your posture like? If you're sitting on a chair like I am, are your soles of your feet flat on the floor or are you know, they sort of lifted up, the heel lifted up and just the balls of the feet on the floor? Which is more comfortable for you? So with your eyes closed, you're more than happy to move your feet. And as you move them, it's like you're exploring. You're trying to find out the most comfortable place right now for your feet. You're not following theories or what other people say. You're being sensitive to your own sensations and how your feet feel right now. You move them until you find the optimum position for them. How far apart are your feet? Do you want to bring them closer together, move them further apart? What works for you? It is quite important that you do do that fidgeting. You don't just assume this is the best. Because when you do move, you do get feedback, it becomes interesting. You find out what is the most comfortable position for your feet. Too often in religion, in Buddhism, meditation, with too many assumptions. And now we're actually finding out the truth for ourselves. How do your feet feel? I'm still adjusting mine. What do I find? Yeah, that's nice. Actually, it's jolly nice. And then I move up my legs, my calves and my legs and nothing much happening there, but still I just pause to make sure they're okay. And then to my healthy knees, making sure that they are comfortable. The knees have a lot of tension in them. So even just wishing them well, dear knees, you just work so hard for me. 
May you be happy and well and peaceful and pain free. And when I send loving kindness to my own knees, as much loving kindness and care, compassion, well wishing as I can generate. I don't know, I don't think I'm imagining it. They feel much better. It's just like they say back to me, thank you. You're fine, but it's really nice to be noticed from time to time. And that allows me to move past my knees, up my thighs. Nothing much happening there. Into my, my butt. There's always something happening in my butt because maybe <laughs> too much weight in my tummy. I don't know. But I just feel the pressure on my, my buttocks on the, the chair. And if I need to adjust, I will, and I'm going to just adjust my buttocks so they are more comfortable. That's good. <coughs> and then for my buttocks, when they're looked after, I move up my back, first of all. And for those of you who listen to me a long time, you know I like stretching my back at this time. Oh, it always feels good. So I see animals do this. The human being is an animal. So I stretch my back. And then after stretching it, then I relax it. Till it gets into the most comfortable position. And then I look at the front of my torso. Check my digestive system. I had a little bit of a breakfast this morning. Maybe happy and well, tummy, intestines, colon. I feel sensations in there. I relax a whole lot. And as I scan my attention upwards, I don't know what the organs are, but they're all pretty comfortable down there today. If you do have any problems in any of those organs, just pause there. Pause and give as much well-wishing and kindness as you possibly can. My liver, my kidneys, my spleen. You work 24 hours every day. Thank you. Give this appreciation, after appreciation, kindness to all these parts of the body which work so hard. Are you saying thank you? Even that creates a feeling of joy, delight in those parts of the body. It's like the workers, you know, who work for you. You just say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate what you're doing. That makes them feel happy. And I use that simile for parts of my body. You go up to the, your lungs. And my lungs, just they're working 69 years, day in, day out, never let me down once. So, so much gratitude. And that makes my lungs relax. Yeah, he's noticed us. My heart. And then once it goes through all the main organs, there's again any tightness, tension anywhere, just stop there, pause, and just give as much kindness as you possibly can. And get to my shoulders. I imagine my shoulders like these muscles which have been pulled apart, stretched for too long. I imagine these invisible demons, like even like uh, monsters, pulling apart these muscles, stretching them. And now I imagine letting them go. So nothing is stretched at all. All the muscles in my shoulders become loose. And my mindfulness, my awareness can feel that. They become at ease. 
That feels really nice. My, my tension goes down my arms. My upper arms, nothing much going on there. My elbows, because I don't play sport. The, the elbows are just a pretty healthy and good. Maybe I was building when I was young. Maybe made them a bit stiff, but they're really good now. If you want to pause there, just learn how to relax. It's amazing what you can relax in your body. Once you have awareness of it, the mindfulness will give you the clues on what relaxation is and what tightness is. You learn how to move from one to the other. Trial and error at first. You're courageous enough to give it a try and see what happens. And then I go down to the wrists and my, my hands. Now, if I wasn't really following this method, I wouldn't have noticed that my hands are just not in a good posture at all. Fingers are all over the place. So I'm now going to move my hands and fingers to a nice, comfortable position. That feels good. The awareness, it serves the, the role of letting you know what's going on and also learning how to make it better. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if, what makes it worse, what makes it better. But the awareness, just on something as simple as your hands, you can feel just how to relax them. Make them feel really at ease. Later, of course, we use that on our mind. We get to know how our mind feels and how to make it better. What makes it worse? Same we do on the body. Do it the body first because it's easier to do. And then I go back to, up to my shoulders, making sure they're still relaxed to my neck. And then making sure the head on top of the neck is just well balanced. I usually move it left and right, forward and back, until I find its optimum position. I, as I'm moving and I'm mindful, aware of my neck and how it feels until so my neck decides what position my head will be. Nicely balanced. Then I go to the front of my face and become aware of the feelings around the eyes and the nose and the forehead. Now, one of the first times I went to Malaysia, many of the meditators uh, were complaining about some Mardi headache. And I was shocked. Never heard that before. And it's because they weren't at all aware of the muscles around their face and they were trying so hard. So mighty headache is not necessary. So check the muscles on your forehead, around the eyes, around the mouth. Relax them all. Get them really loose and at ease. And of course, you all know that the muscles in the face, the way they are configured, often relates to the stress, the fear, the anxiety, the disappointment in your mind. It's like the state of mind is played out on your face. So if you relax your muscles of your face, you're also relaxing your emotions. And a little smile on the face, a little smile is the best posture you can have. And once you've relaxed your face, then just be aware of your whole body sitting here. Not in parts, but as a unit. If there's any parts which are still a bit tight, which need relaxing, please focus on them. So if your attention just zooms in, like on Google Maps or something, zoom in and give it kindness. After a while, we learn how to relax our body. 
how to even heal pain. Try this, we try that. And mindfulness is always watching and finds out what works for us. But how you relax a cold or a tumor or an injury. Very simple insights into how to maintain a healthy body. And I'm aware of the delight of a relaxed body now. The feel good factor of relaxation. I really encourage you to be aware of the delight of relaxation. It makes the relaxation so much deeper. Later on, when we start meditating on things like the breathing, you notice a delightful breath. As the Buddha said, watching the breath with piti sukha. You know where it comes from. You start it off with your body. The peace, relaxation, very pleasurable. Enjoy it. I have to sign off now. Other duties to do. Lots of people coming to monitor today. It's supposed to be done in five minutes. So those of you who want to carry on meditating, please do so. Those that it's time for you to, to stop for the next part of the program, please do. It's now 25 past 10. I wish you all happiness and well-being. And I'll, I'll, personally, I'll see you this evening. Actually, Bamali will be uh, logging it at 3 p.m. Happy meditating. And just relax to the max. Oh, that's nice. Bye.